intro. <laughs> <laughs> Never. And um, <laughs> I'm delighted to be here. And um, well, I think this is going to be fun. I'd like to uh, welcome the two students that are here and encourage you while you're here to come down and see St. Mary's College. You might want to come back and spend a year with us. And of course, I would also be remiss if I didn't say one of your Rotarians is a former student of mine, and that's my sitting in the back. Uh, my classes are two hours long, <laughs> um, but I promise that we will not be here that long. And my goal today, although um, I know that if you're interested in poverty, is to talk a little bit about that, um, but I'm going to give a little bit more upbeat, I think, kind of uh, uh, talk, and um, hopefully have you think about some things that you might not have thought about before with poverty. We did hand some things out. I'm going to mention a forum that we had in Baltimore. That is the Blue United Not Divided pamphlet. That's just for you to look at and see the breadth of that um, two-day forum. Um, we had a forum then in St. Mary's that Robin attended, and I think that's another reason why she asked me to come, because uh, it was a we had a community forum and the small little pamphlet with the uh, cowl in the front. <laughs> Uh, was produced by my students, and that was why I'm here. And then the next one is what's up and coming at the Center for Democracy. So a little bit more background uh, from me is that the Center for the Study of Democracy, which is at St. Mary's College, along with uh, President Jordan, decided that we would have a year-long theme on economic inequality and opportunity gaps. And that was the basis of a two-day forum in Baltimore. We started, why, why Baltimore? Um, we were talking about this in the spring of, night of 2015. Um, the Freddie Gray riots had just taken place in West Baltimore. A lot of our students are from there. And we thought, we need to do something. We, and we wanted to show our support to our students from Baltimore who had friends in Baltimore. And um, so it was the first time ever that we did something like that. And I think it was uh, one day focused on national and national issues, and then we focused on Baltimore and West Baltimore. And then when I was found myself in the planning part of this, I was going to be co-chair of that <coughs> forum, I thought if I had to do that much work, I was going to also teach a class and get my students involved. And so that's what happened. Um, I taught a class on economic inequality, but instead of focusing on Baltimore and the national issues, they focused primarily on St. Mary's County. So we brought it back here. Um, I, uh, it was a special class. I told them the first day that they were not my students, they were my research assistants. And I think I didn't know this until the end of the semester, but it was very intimidating for them to think that they actually had a different kind of responsibility. But um, at the end, I told them that they had a choice of talking to each other about what they found, where we could talk to the community, and to my surprise and delight, they chose the community. A day in last April when we had over 50 people attending to talk about these issues. Um, so let's start with some breaking news. It happened last week. I heard that the um, household income had increased by 5.2%. <laughs> Wages had increased. And, and the median income was $56,500. And that the biggest, we had the biggest drop in the percent of people living in poverty since 1968. Now, what do those statistics mean? Well, first of all, I did not have a 5.2% increase in my, um, I did not even have a wage increase. <laughs> Um, so something else is going on with those numbers, and I want to tell you the most significant thing probably is that big drop in poverty. So take a step back, remember what it was like to be in a class, you have a test, several people don't do very well. Class average is low. You let those students retake the test, they do a lot better. All of those numbers go up. And so a lot of what happened, I believe, is that we have in fact seen a decrease in poverty, that's the good news. And part of that then helps to bridge that economic gap. So I want to come back to those statistics a little bit later. I am a demographer, but I know that that's not a good way to talk at 7 or 8 o'clock in the morning. So we'll <laughs> not do that. But I am going to go back to my class for a moment and say where we started. And we started with a book 
called The Long Shadow by Carl Alexander. He's a sociologist at Johns Hopkins University, and in 1982, he started interviewing young children and their parents and their teachers, uh, a sample of all of Baltimore, but there is a focus on areas that are poor, again, West Baltimore. He studied this same group for 28 years. That's unheard of in terms of longitudinal studies to keep up with people. Uh, so it is probably the most comprehensive study that we have on long-term poverty that follows the same group. And who leaves and why do they leave and very, very intense, very quantitative. The other book that I had them read is by Robert Putnam. It's called Our Kids, the American Dream in Crisis. Uh, earlier, you may know his book, he wrote a book called Bowling Alone. Um, it was very popular about the crisis in communities. Uh, which would be an interesting book for this group to read. Uh, but it's a qualitative book. It doesn't have really a lot of statistics in it. He's a PhD um, political scientist at Harvard, and he wrote this book for all of us. And so I do recommend this one to you. I think it was my student's favorite book. Um, that being said, we did that, and then um, uh, we also started in, with some issues about sociology, and the one I want to say here is an assumption that my husband Tom I know can recite, and that is, he's laughing, a class society cannot produce classless results. It just can't happen. Which means we'll probably always have poverty. If you have a class society, somebody is at the bottom. We do redefine what poverty looks like. Um, but that's not, you know, that's what we are. We expect income differences. We expect differences. We expect it and we accept it. So the question is not that that exists. The question is how big those gaps have to be. And that's the question that we're asking today. Um, and so we start with that assumption. Um, and so we also assume that we can provide opportunities for people. Which are the things that I think you probably know about? Uh, the sociologist is always looking for the unintended consequences, so we also need to think about the invisible barriers. Opportunities for mobility are going to be obvious to you, and you can see them every day in St. Mary's County. In education, we have programs such as Head Start, Judy Centers, some summer programs for tutoring. In housing, there are tax breaks for first-time home makers. There are subsidies for rentals, occupational opportunities and mentoring, internships, options in higher education. Health and safety, there's the WIC program. Uh, independence card for food purchases and unique, by the way, to St. Mary's Co uh, County is health share. For anyone who recently attended the United Way, I know we all tend to belong to a lot of different things, you were seeing firsthand, obviously, at the breakfast held a week or so ago, the number of community organizations and people in St. Mary's that really are already in some kind of way working on this issue, whether you kind of identify it that way or not. But Oh, and we have so many, we have a lot of those organizations, and I think St. Mary should also be proud because the other rural counties in Maryland do not have these things. So we're kind of unique. That's the upbeat part that I think. Now, when I mentioned we also have um, invisible barriers, uh, there's big differences between social classes other than income, wealth, and resources. And in my class, we started talking about these as not so much as barriers, but we used a more scientific term, the subtle stuff. Scientific term. <laughs> the soft stuff. And I'm going to give you a few examples of that because I want you to know what we're talking about here. And I'm hoping that you will you know, sort of pick up on some of this. So who do you know and who do you call for help? For opportunities, we can set up mentoring programs and we can encourage networking. We can set up boys and girls clubs. I think we have those. We should keep those. They're very important. Um, but there's another type of networking that takes place within social classes. It's the soft, subtle stuff that occurs when you can call your neighbor and they can tell you how your children should apply for college. They can tell you things that you should put on that application. They might even tell you what colleges you should look at. And then lastly, they may offer to write your son or daughter a letter of reference. That is the soft mentoring that takes place that is not available to everybody else. 
if you're poor, your neighbors don't have the answers to those questions that we think about are really important for education. Another example, I would say you have the ability to call and use my name if you have a question about banking. That's the subtle stuff. Another example, um, which was a surprise to me about a year ago, I hadn't heard about it, hadn't thought, hadn't thought about it really. Children from professional families hear 19 million more words by the time they reach kindergarten than working class families. 32 million more words than children on welfare. In terms of the types of words, it's in the thousands. The advantage obviously goes to children from professional families. Now, can we do something about this? Well, yes, we have in St. Mary's County. Janice Walthour, who's president of the NAACP, may not have known about those numbers and didn't know about those numbers, but she and a group of volunteers have been going to the Lexington Park Social Service Office to read to children while their parents, mostly mothers, are with social workers. <laughs> I love that, by the way. I wish she were here in the audience and then we could clap for her. Um, but that's, again, another way to bridge that subtle stuff gap, the number of words we hear. Research also shows us, actually from the 1970s, we started to learn this, that parenting styles differ greatly by social class. Well-educated parents tend to focus on teaching and discipline that reinforces autonomy, independence, and self-direction. Now, note these are the characteristics that if you have a professional job, are how you get rewarded. And we pass that on to our children. These children also tend to have higher self-esteem. Less well-educated parents tend to focus the teaching and discipline, sometimes on those characteristics, but with an emphasis that reinforces obedience and conformity to pre-established rules. Now, I said this has been going on for a long time, so I want you to note the influence of the assembly line type jobs, the rewards that went mostly to fathers. You cannot be creative on the assembly line, are what we subtly teach to our children. Now, this class-bound parenting may be okay for those in the professional class because those are the, still the rewards we have, but for children in working class and especially those children in poverty, the loss of jobs, blue-collar jobs, to technological change have dramatically changed the characteristics needed to be successful in 2016. So that, again, is the sort of very subtle stuff that we're not aware of, that sort of creeps in, that acts as an invisible, invisible barrier and that we have to think about carefully. Now, closer to home, because again, here's the work of my students, they decided that the number one barrier in St. Mary's College was, again, the scientific term called getting there. <laughs> travel to, particip to participate in sports, travel to get to the doctors, travel to have an appointment with a teacher. If you don't have a car, you don't get there. If your neighbor's car is the same as your car, either isn't there or isn't working, you don't have that network to get there either. Um, that means that children themselves can't participate if they don't <laughs> get there and if they don't have a ride home. So again, that's sort of that subtle thing that I think that we look about and we can take for granted, but if you, then you're, you're not getting those other soft resources, of participation in sports, which is so important for so many reasons. Now I'm going to come back to those statistics. Again, nationally, the median income is $56,500 a year. But in Maryland, it's over 75000 In St. Mary's County, it's $88,190. And the mean income in St. Mary's County is over $100,000 a year. So poverty dropped to its lowest level since 1968. In St. Mary's County, I'm going to use the word only, only 5% of households live below poverty in our county. Maryland, it's 10%. And nationally, there's a range, 8% in New Hampshire and 22% in Mississippi. So while no poverty is really good, 
I wanted to tell you that Maryland and, and St. Mary's County in particular also are always working very hard on helping and trying to make the lives of people better. Uh, now, this also, yeah. What is the, what actually is the poverty level? What is the, the effect figure? Do you know off the top of your hand? More, you mean what does 5%? No, no, no the, the actual dollar figure in terms of. Oh, income. well, you know, it's complicated, but it, because it goes by the number of people in the household and farm and non farm, and we're in a little, little funny place, but it's about $28,000 okay. a year for a family of four. So that's pretty low to begin with. And what that means, that income distribution. So now you have that baseline of twenty-eight thousand. He's the student in the class. Yeah. <laughs> Interrupting the life. And he knows. And he knows I can be interrupted at any point in time. <laughs> um, in our class structure here, uh, we have, and I think some of you know this, a funny hour-shaped kind of thing. Uh, Forty-two percent of our population makes over that median income makes over $100,000. So we actually have a very heavy top. Usually you see a sort of pyramid structure or something like this, mm -hmm. but ours goes like this. Um, and then we have a really small compressed middle class. There's good and bad. Some of those middle, it's compressed. Some of the middle class have actually moved up, gotten better jobs, and some have fallen down. So it's a, it's a funny kind of structure here in St. Mary's class. And it basically our middle class is too small. That's what I would say. Now, do I think that that means we should redistribute in income and take away money from the professional classes? And the answer is no. But I do think, again, here's this issue of how we bridge that gap as a community. We need to keep spending our dollars in the community to support the local small businesses to help them thrive and strive. I think that, again, is that what builds that middle class up so that they have the opportunities to make the next step um, and then what will help other people as well um, in their community, and I can't stress that um, any <coughs> excuse me uh, enough because I think again uh, that's the backbone of small communities like we have. Of course, you all know that because you participate in so many different things. So, what overall did my class learn? Well, they learned that they didn't have to be intimidated because when, in fact, they presented their information to the St. Mary's County community. Um, they had just a sense of people really wanted to know what we had to say, and they did a great job. I let them design everything. The pamphlets, they were all done by them. The graphics were all done by them, and so they learned a lot. But I also saw a few of them the other day, and I asked them what they want you to learn from my talk. And they answered that we all need to pay attention to the subtle stuff. That's where the change will really come from. When I then challenged them with the question of, well, how do we change to make up for the subtle stuff? They answered, well, we don't know. <laughs> and they, but then they said, but that's what we're going to work on. You know, to be aware is the first thing, and to work on it is the next. And of course, they get that because I tell them that I'm going to be retiring at some point, and it's going to be their job to take over. I know that Robin learned that our students are a great resource and that she, we can pull together lots of information and uh, that's available in St. Mary's County, put it together and be able to present it back to you. And in fact, I brought every statistic there probably is on Maryland, um, St. Mary's County, Lexington Park, and Leonardtown, which I'm going to give to you, which is easily available now if you know where to look. Not the reports, but the data. So I can find just about any question you're going to ask me <laughs> at some point. Um, and then the last thing I want to say is where do we go from here? And that's my conclusion to say the Center for the Demo uh, Center of Democracy does a lot of things, not just on economic inequality, but our next <coughs> program is a panel discussion on criminal justice, poverty, and race, very timely. And I would like you to join our judges, our local judges, Peter Massetti, Karen Abrams, and Jim Kenny, along with several others from the state of Maryland. That program you have, a little brochure, is on October 6th in State St. Mary's Hall. If you want to come to the reception prior to that at 7, please RSVP. Um, if not, it's, the event is free and open to the public, and, and we hope to see you there um, in two weeks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take some questions.